right, well, thank you so much for having me. And um, I guess my name is Jeff Lindsay. I started diving about 30 years ago now. And I'm here on the invite of Arlindo. So I guess, first of all, I wanna congratulate Ar Arlindo and the whole team on bringing all of us together and putting all of this together. So uh, thank you so much for having me. But uh, he invited me to talk about a place that's very near and dear to my heart. And although like I'm sure so many of us in this room, we've been so fortunate to have the experiences and dive through around this planet and meet uh, wonderful friendships and people through the diving. But um, I keep coming back to the Great Lakes and it's a, it's a place that's near and dear to my heart. And uh, hopefully these photos can kind of show you why that's the case. So a little bit about the Great Lakes before we get into to some photos. Um, you know, where are they? What are they? I'll keep this real brief because I'm, I'm sure most of us are aware of this already. But uh, I was looking through some notes the other day. And to put it in context, um, the Bermuda Triangle, I'm sure everybody here has heard of the Bermuda Triangle. And apparently the, the Bermuda Triangle has around 100 shipwrecks documented between ships and planes lost in the Bermuda Triangle. The low estimates on the Great Lakes are around 6,000, and the high estimates are somewhere around 11,000. So I'm not sure why we don't hear more about the Great Lakes other than maybe they're too remote. I'm not sure. But uh, So to, or this morning, we're going to talk about um, three particular shipwrecks, and we're going to look at one area that uh, for some reason has just a crazy concentration of shipwrecks. So I was going to talk a little bit about history, and I realized history in Europe is quite different than history of North America. You know, anything older than me in North America is considered old, and even me sometimes. But uh, in Europe, that's a bit different. So, but it all kind of started in terms of transportation um, of what the Great Lakes provided, and that was a really easy corridor to get from the Atlantic to the interior, because at that time, you know, 300 years ago, there was absolutely no way. There's no no transportation network. So the lakes really provided that, that transportation. And so it was about 1680, uh, the French explorer La Salle, he built the very first um, modern, modern sailing ship. And uh, it was about three months later, we had our very first shipwreck on the Great Lakes and the La Salle has never been found. So it's a all too common occurrence. So the, the first shipwreck we're gonna look at in detail here is called the Manasu, and this one was located uh, just a couple years ago. So it's 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 one of the one of the more recent finds. So the Manasu was built in Scotland in 1888, and it was originally built just as a passenger ship, but over its career, it was sort of lengthened and turned into a, a cargo slash passenger ship, multi-purpose ship. And it's this archive photo on the right that. Uh, shows it in its final configuration. So that's, um, that's a real brief look at what it looks like or what it used to look like. So it's September 1928 and the Manasu was done for the season. It was laid up for winter. So typically the boats would run in the summertime and the winter time they're put up um, because of the ice. There's just no option to run. And it was hired to travel up to Manitoulin Island, pick up a hundred cattle and transport them back to Southern Ontario. So the, again, keep in mind, there's really no way to do that sort of work. There was no transportation network. So the only way to move material like cattle around the lakes would be by ship. And so it's mid-September, uh, we're just off of Griffith Island. And imagine this scenario, it's midnight, you're asleep in your bunk, everything's fine. A storm comes up, but it's not a storm that's too outrageous, and in five minutes, you go from asleep in your bunk to treading water. The boat simply is gone instantly. There was no time to react. There was no time to, to launch lifeboats. It absolutely vanished underneath people's feet. And then you're in the lake, it's pitch black, and you're treading water. And that's something that just, when I, when I visit this wreck, that kind of always sticks in my mind as to, you know, what it, what that experience would have been, just absolutely terrifying. So, but this is the Manasu today. And uh, you can see, you know, first up in the, in the lakes are so special for giving us this level of preservation. I don't know 
where else you can find this. I know there's other places, but the lakes is pretty incredible for that. So before we, we jump in, so the archive photo I've kept up on the right, and that's really just as, um, as a note to show what the ship did look like in its final configuration. Um, I've highlighted with that small circle there where I was when I took the photo. We've got a depth over on the left. So for example, in this one, we're in about 55 meters. And uh, in the bottom right, you can kind of see just a very rough um, outline of the Great Lakes and where we're at in the lakes. And uh, so you can see that we're upright, it's intact, and um, it's sitting slightly bow high, and the stern looks to me like it hit pretty hard. So it's, I'd say about the back quarter is fairly broken up, but the forward three quarters of the ship are completely intact. And here's a close-up of the wheelhouse. So it's pretty rare on the lakes, at least to see wheelhouse, a wheelhouse is that it is intact on these shipwrecks. Probably, I suspect anyways, they're, they're damaged during the initial sinking and they're lost, but this one is completely intact. You can see the wheel. And if you look very carefully in the center of the photo, you can actually even see the clock is still on the wall. So there's always a, a lot of debate after every dive as to what time is on the clock. And I, I still don't know for sure because the hands are gone, but there are two rust lines where the hands used to be. So to me, it looks like it is very close to midnight or maybe about five after, and the records do show that. So maybe it's true. So below deck, if you just go one deck down, you can kind of see we've highlighted the area where there's an opening on the side of the ship, and this opening is in front of this car. So just to kind of give you a reference where we are. So this is a 1927 Chevy Coupe, and the interesting story behind this is this belonged to the person who hired the ship to go up. So he took his car, drove to the island, went around, purchased all these cattle, loaded them on the boat, but sadly he lost all of his cattle. He lost his brand new car, but he did survive the sinking. He was one of the very few that actually survived. So again, to see this level of preservation with um, the ship's wheel, uh, or sorry, the uh, um, wooden wheels on these cars, uh, the tires are still there. Just the, the detail that you can see is pretty amazing. One other thing to note here, um, you can see these muscles, these, they're, they're zebra muscles or quagga muscles, and they cover much of the wreck, both inside and out. So they came, uh, they were introduced into the Great Lakes from Europe. I'm sure it wasn't Portugal, I think it was somebody else, but um, they came from Europe in the late 1980s, and so they've had some impact on the lakes. So they're in four out of the five Great Lakes right now, and um, we find that it really increases the clarity of the water but we get our wrecks covered in muscles, so it's kind of a, a give-take, I suppose. So further aft, we come to the engine room, and this was kind of a real surprise. I was um, really fortunate to be invited to document this wreck very, very early on when it was just found. So at this point, no one had even identified where the engine room was, so I happened to have camera in hand, and this was the very first exploration of this engine room. So to, to be invited to do that and to document um, basically an undisturbed shipwreck was a pretty special event in my life and uh, I'm fortunate that uh, I'm able to go back and do this over and over again so it's I won't lie it's a lot of fun and then further aft still we come to the midship stairs so if you look real careful on the left you can see there's a fire extinguisher and there's even a bicycle that belonged to the chief engineer and uh, again this all of these artifacts start building a story in my head about the people that worked on this ship, the people that sadly died on this ship, and what it would have been like 100 years ago on the lakes on this ship. But um, I, the other thing I want to point out in this photo is that it, we can kind of see just how delicate this is. This is a wooden ship. It's been underwater for almost 100 years. You know, this, is, um, this requires a lot of attention to detail to get into, to photograph, not just in terms of safety, but Obviously, to take these photographs, you have a very limited time to get in. It's very silty. You need to be incredibly cautious about um, not only your safety, but trying to preserve the image as well, too. So it is, it is a challenge. And then if we move to the upper deck, we can kind of see the, the main passageway. And in each one of these rooms are staterooms. So there's a set of bunk beds uh, in each one of these rooms, some running water, overhead lighting that would really paint a picture. And I think the price I saw was something like $2.25, I think, for, for a two-day two passage on the ship. So it's incredible to think what you could get for your money. And then one last photo of the Manistu here. So 
again, we can kind of see the story behind how quick this ship went down. The lifeboats, there were four, are all still with the ship. And we can see on this one, um, the, the oars are actually still tied in place. So imagine that, the, there was just no time for the people on this wreck. So the, the sad story is that although when the ship sunk, it was relatively close to Griffith Island, the winds were blowing offshore. So the people that survived the sinking were blown out into the lake and they drifted to the opposite side of Georgian Bay. And that took one day to reach that shore. But even more unfortunately, the winds turned 180 degrees when they were in sight of shore and blew them all the way back to the other side of Georgian Bay. So unfortunately, there was only, I think, five survivors of the Manasu after two days on the water. So sad story, but um, part of the history of this place that I just find so fascinating. And oh, one other note, everybody's usually interested in temperature. Typically, all of these photos uh, throughout the presentation are going to be at depth, be somewhere between 4 Celsius and 2 Celsius. So it's, it's pretty common in the lakes. It's below the thermocline. It's cold. There's no, there's no sugarcoating that. So the next wreck, we're going to move to a different lake now. We're going to be on Lake Superior. And this ship, uh, called the Kamloops, it was more of a, a modern type steel freighter. So it was built for cargo trade and its cargo that what it would carry would be any sort of finished product. So it could be any merchandise, anything that was needed. And so its typical run would be from the Atlantic ports into the interior. And that's what it was doing in December uh, 1927. And so let's, um, the interesting story about uh, the Kamloops is that it was a really modern steel ship. It shouldn't have sunk. It shouldn't have been lost. It had made several crossings of the Atlantic. So here we are. It's December 1927, and just like the Manasu, it was the last scheduled run of the season. It uh, finds itself in the middle of Lake Superior, and suddenly a storm comes up, which is not uncommon that time of year. But of course, in December, it's a snowstorm, blinding snowstorm, freezing rain, uh, and the, the, the Kamloops simply disappears. It's gone. And that was a real shock because, again, this was a modern ship. It shouldn't have been lost. So 50 years go by, and it's located at the bottom of this underwater cliff. And it, this cliff is, um, or sorry, this, this land, landform here is actually Isle Royale, and it's a national park. So even today, this park is 100% wilderness. There's, it's, there's nothing there. So it's just um, forest and maybe a ranger station. So certainly 100 years ago, it was equally as remote. And so just keep that in mind as we talk, but it's located at the bottom of this underwater cliff in about, I think, 80 meters of water. So we can see the Manasus rolled onto its side and we're at the stern section here looking up towards the surface. So right off the bat, we can kind of notice that the clarity isn't quite what we would see in the lower lakes. We're, we're now in Lake Superior. So the visibility isn't quite as what we would see, but we also notice there's no zebra mussels here either. So what it takes away in clarity, we gain in the fine details of the shipwrecks. So there is, a, there is that trade-off. So again, it's rolled onto its starboard side. We're looking at the stern here, and it sits stern high, bow down. So you run into the stern at about 60 meters, and we will progress through our dive uh, headed towards the bow. So there were, there were two helm stations on the Kamloops, and the forward helm, like so common, was lost during the initial sinking, but the stern auxiliary helm is still intact. So we can see the ship's wheel is still there, the compass, um, basically everything that was needed sort of at a bare minimum to run the ship. There, you can also see the uh, um, uh, skylights for the overhead galley. So just inside those, those skylights are the, um, the whole kitchen and mess area for the ship. One real interesting part of the, the history of the Kamloops, uh, a year after it was lost, there was actually a message in a bottle found. I know this, I only thought happened in movies, but it apparently happens in real life too. And that message was wrote by uh, a woman named Alice Betridge, and she was a crew member of the Kamloops. And like I'd mentioned earlier, on Isle Royale, it is a wilderness park. And sadly, she made it to, uh, to the park. So she survived the initial sinking um, but was unfortunately marooned on this island in Lake Superior in December. And if you've ever been to that part of uh, the continent in December, you can realize it is extremely cold and temperatures of minus 40 wouldn't be uncommon. So if you were marooned on an island like that with nothing in minus 40, you have no chance of survival. And I believe there were 
three individuals that survived the sinking only to, to later perish on the island. So the Kamloops was carrying a huge variety of cargo and one of, the, one of the interesting bits of cargo that we see over and over again are these cases of hard candy. And I don't know if they've ever made it to Europe, but they still make them in North America called Lifesavers candies. And it's kind of fascinating, at least for me, because I think you can go into the store today in North America and buy Lifesaver candies, and it looks exactly like these Lifesaver candies that are on the ship. So we like to think maybe history moves quick and things change quick, but maybe not that quick. But this is in the interior hold, and there's just cases of equipment and who knows what throughout this wreck. It was carrying everything from barrels of whiskey to toothpaste, matchsticks, shoes, candy, all sorts of food goods. Uh, it just goes on and on, and it's interesting to see that all of the things that were needed 100 years ago are pretty much the same things we need today. So to pause at this photo real quick, um, the archive photo was a gift to me for this presentation, and it was for um, it was from the uh, uh, an individual who actually is a relative uh, of of the engineer, Mr. Arthur Hammon, and so it's this picture was taken two months before the Kamloops sunk. So a picture of the captain and uh, the the chief engineer. So I'd really like to to to, to thank the Hammon family for that uh, incredible photo. And for me, it kind of really ties together the. Um, the history of these ships and why it, it really strikes to my heart. All right, the next ship we're going to look at in detail is um, the Judge Hart. And where the Kamloops was really for um, package freight, the Hart was for uh, basically general goods, like um, unfinished goods, like wheat, coal, stone, things like that. So again, we're back in Lake Superior. It's uh, late in the season. And the heart has left Thunder Bay, and it's moving to the south. So it's taking unfinished goods out of the lakes uh, down to Toronto. When, again, off the North Shore, a very similar storm comes up, and they decide that they can run to the North Shore for protection. And very quickly, they find out that they can't see anything in this storm. It's blowing snow, freezing rain, and one minute they're in 60 meters of water, and the next minute they're on a ledge of rocks. So. Um, the good news is, is that everyone was able to um, survive the sinking of the Judge Hart, uh, and the good news for us now is that it's a beautiful shipwreck in 60 meters of water. The, there's intact shipwrecks, and, and then in my mind there's the Judge Hart. I've never seen a ship as intact as this. You can see the painted name on the stern here. Again, on the stern deck, you can see the steering gear, and all there is is just a fine layer of silt on this shipwreck. And if you look at the archive photo, the only difference, the only signs of damage that I could see is the, the smokestack has fallen over. But other than that, absolutely everything is still in place and as it should be. So this is the wheelhouse of the Judge Hart. And every time I, I, I'm fortunate enough to go see this wreck, I have to really remind myself that I have a camera in hand and then I have a job to do. I need to take some photos because too often I'll, I'll be in this position in the doorway and the camera will be floating beside me and I'll just sort of be staring at it in disbelief. It doesn't matter how many times I've seen it. I've, I started diving this shipwreck in 2003, I think, and uh, I've been fortunate to see it a number of times, but we've got the wheel, the telegraph, the compass, uh, even the, the stool that the helmsman would sit on. If you look very carefully on the, uh, on the cabinet, you can see there's a set of binoculars, a radio direction finder, light bulbs, picture frames, a clock, um, uh, plaques with the Morse code symbols in it still all on the wall. So imagine that it's been 80 years, I think, and it's still completely intact and in place. Just aft of the pilot house, the bell is still there, the original bell still in the mast, still with the rigging. Um, like I said, this, there's a level of intactness. I'm not sure if that's a word, but there's a level of that on this wreck that is, I think, mind-blowing. All right, so Switch gears a little bit, we're gonna look at one area of the Great Lakes in particular, and for some reason, it's, there's a lot of shipwrecks here. The density is pretty impressive, and they find more every year. I think there was three additional wrecks found just this past summer. So we'll look, um, we'll look at a few in detail, but why are there so many shipwrecks? We've got three lakes kind of converging together, so we've got a, a natural bottleneck where all the ships need to work through. There's a lot of reefs, shoals, uh, fog, and you know, these are sailors, so there's probably some alcohol involved too, I would suspect. You won't see that in the books, but I'm just making that assumption. 
So this is one of the older ships in that particular area called the Defiance, and it was a two-masted sailing ship, and it was actually would use uh, a rudder to steer rather than a ship's wheel. But to kind of give you an idea of you know, some of the visibility that we can expect now in the Great Lakes, when I started diving this area 30 years ago, visibility would be about from here maybe to the edge of the platform. And now anything less than 60 meters, we're kind of upset about that, you know, why wasn't it 70 meter visibility? It's kind of spoiled. But so the, the Defiance was sunk in a collision and uh, the ship that it collided with, the JJ Autobahn, was also um, sunk nearby. So pretty nice to see too. The Uganda is another ship in that area. And interesting story about the Uganda is that it actually has a sister ship as well. They're mirror images of each other. I've had a chance to dive both of them. They're both in Lake Michigan. The, um, the archive photo is actually a picture of the LR Doty, which is the sister ship to the Uganda, which is in the main photo. And um, the Uganda sits about 30 meters shallower than the Doty. And the Uganda still has this beautiful midship cabin with the glass pane still in the window. So again, some of the detail we can see on these wrecks. Now, if you had asked me when I was five years old, what does this shipwreck look like, and gave me some crayons and some paper, and I'm pretty sure I probably drew this, it would have three masts, it would have a, a little lifeboat, it would have a ship's wheel, it would have a little cabin, and uh, I, for a long time in my career, I thought, well, that was just fantasy, that doesn't really exist, and then I got to dive the Windy 8, and here's another picture of the Windy 8, because to me, it's just one of those pretty little wrecks. It's um, not much is known about it. I suspect it was just a, a very simple uh, working ship from the mid 1800s. And when it was lost in Lake Michigan, it was never thought of again. And when it was found in 1986, it was in Lake Huron. It wasn't even where they thought it was. And uh, it's just its level of what it represented at that time, I think, in, in the sailing history is something that's a, it's hard to imagine. And even when I look at it today, I think, uh, it's incredible that we, we could build such beautiful things. Also in that area, the Typo, similar three-masted schooner. This was lost in a collision that um, was uh, basically uh, rammed from behind. So uh, beautiful, beautiful intact bow. And I'm getting, I'm getting our Lindo here telling me to hurry it up, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to power through the rest of these. The Superior City, uh, Lake Superior, again, no zebra mussels, dark. Cold, yes, we're down about 80 meters. Uh, incredible detail. And then we always get questions as divers, you know, have you ever found any treasure? And my standard response is no, if I had, I wouldn't even be here right now, but that's not, no, I'd still be here. Um, the Comet was carrying 70 tons of silver ore and somebody uh, very early on decided to recover that ore. So obviously it was pretty valuable. Um, but I think the real treasure that we all find is you know, the, the experiences, the friendships, and the relationships we build through this. So um, that's, that's the real treasure here. So, so to sum it all up, you know, I, I feel like too many times in my career, I've, I've heard the comment, oh, you should have been here 10 years ago. You should have been here 20 years ago. You should have seen it like it used to be. And I think the Great Lakes right now, with these shipwrecks that we're finding, this is the best time to be doing this. It is the best time to see these wrecks. Technology is now down to the average individual where they can go out and find these wrecks. Every year, there's more and more wrecks found. Technology is now available through many people here diving close circuit rebreathers. We can spend more time at these depths, more time to take these photos and document these wrecks. So all too often, you know, you've heard that you should have been here 10 years ago. Now is the right time, is the perfect time. And uh, I can't say how happy I am that we're able to go do this. So. That's kind of a little glimpse into my mind. I won't show you much more than that because the rest is scary, but uh, thank you very much um, for, for your attention and I hope, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>